Yeah, they went into where Skinner was. Skinner looked like a trip. That's why I do that. He'll get him a five. And you throw you throw this. Joe Farragalli talking to his quarterback, Damon Allen, Winnipeg's Allen. Michael returns the kickoff to the 45-yard line. Well, Sandusky come in with six touchdown receptions. This is number seven. This is what Allen comes back, reads the demon, now just floats it outside, as we said, an excellent pattern run by Sandusky. And then with the ball thrown low into the outside, you watch Sandusky. If he doesn't get it, nobody gets it. Look at it. Looking back into the sun, he makes the catch. So number seven, Jim Sandusky, matches his uniform number in touchdown production, his seventh of the season. The Eskimos in front 14-1. This is too long in getting the play underway. A time count violation against Sean Salisbury. You know what you like to see is Danny Bass and, and Brian Warren both raise their arms in victory, you know, because they fooled the quarterback. They were in a defense. He tried to audible, took too long. That's just like a win for the defense. And many times that 20-second clock causes problems for a quarterback coming to the CFL from the States. I'll tell you, 20 seconds is not a long time. Throwing deep for James Murphy. Murphy had his man beat. There's a penalty flag. Murphy was bumped by Stanley Blair. Are they calling it offensive or defensive interference? Well, this would be defensive. I don't think there's any doubt about it. When Murphy went down, he kind of hesitated, and then he tried to go deep. Blair was coming up to try to make the interception and collided with him. But there was also a holding call charged against Winnipeg. One penalty each way. So it will be first down over again. Still 15 yards remaining. Mike Riley still has to be disturbed about what happened to his bombers earlier in this second quarter when they were first and goal from the three and a half. Put the ball in the end zone, but had it wiped out by an illegal procedure call against offensive tackle Chris Walden. Yeah, I was expecting him to be a receiver. Salisbury throwing, and he was looking for Perry Tuttle, but the ball was behind Tuttle. Don Wilson had come over to help in the coverage on the Winnipeg slot back. It will be second and 15 with 327 remaining in the half. Salisbury's going to have to look inside to Tuttle going deep and then go back outside to Jeff Smith. The Eskimos sat in a defense and all they did was run to that football when it was in the air. Well, we talked earlier about the number of categories that the Edmonton Eskimos lead the league in defensively. They also lead the league in seven offensive categories. Salisbury's in trouble. And Winnipeg will be forced to kick back at the 32-yard line as Gary Columbus managed to get to the Winnipeg quarterback. 3.04 is the time remaining in the half. We'll be back with the Winnipeg third down punt after this. University degree paid for. Study history, physics, medicine, engineering, name it. Join students like these who are getting a university degree, a salary, and that important first job, all paid for by the Canadian Armed Forces. Want a degree and a future? We're under recruiting in the yellow pages. Choose a career. Live the adventure. I'll take the Michelins. I can save you a little on another brand. Why take chances when there's Michelin? A tire's a tire. My last set of Michelins lasted much longer than I ever hoped for. Tell me the truth. Aren't you buying them just for the name? Yeah. <laughs> the name is Jackie. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. Roy DeWalt. Unlimbers his throwing arm behind the Winnipeg bench. Perhaps he will be coming in for the next offensive series. 
if Winnipeg does get the ball back in this first half they are punting on third down Cameron standing at his own 17 yard line. The ball bounces back to the gizmo at the 25 yard line nowhere for him to go good coverage by Winnipeg on the punt return team. Let's bring in Scott Oak. Well, Don, seizing an opportunity can change your career. Sean Salisbury made the most of his chance to start a quarterback for the Bombers last week, and that's why he started this game. He be, he'll be our guest live on Inside the CFL at halftime, and there is no arguing the success of the career of one Dan Bass of the Edmonton Eskimos. We'll have a feature report on the heart and soul of the Eskimo defense, their middle linebacker, Dan Bass, at halftime. Damon Allen directing the Eskimos first and 10 from the 25-yard line. Loose ball, who's got it? And it looks like Wicklam has recovered. Well, the Bomber offense has sputtered all day, but this is a chance with Roy DeWalt coming in at quarterback. They've got to put it in the end zone. Watch the ball. In his hands, he bobbles the snap. It's all over the place, and the race is on. Here comes Whitcomb, 35. He ends up with it. Now they have a chance to put some points on the board. So with the recovery by Dan Wicklum, it is first and 10. Roy DeWalt directing the attack from the 12-yard line. Penalty flags as DeWalt throws complete. Touchdown to Terry Cochran. The second touchdown he has scored. This one will not count out. Uh, he has seen grab the football. He's been trying for two years to get his first touchdown in this league, and he's got two up today. You see him slam the ball down. He's got to be getting a little disappointed. Throw to somebody else because it's not his day. Well, Terry Cochran, a Regina product, looking forward to getting a chance to play on a fairly regular basis in this game. Two touchdowns, neither of them have counted, both wiped out by illegal procedure calls. So it is second and ten, uh, second and first and 15. Let's get it straight back at the 17 yard line. DeWalt throws to Perry Tuttle. He's hit hard right at the five yard line. What a great read by DeWalt. Cochran went in motion. He went in motion and he went out into the flat and the linebacker went with it and Tuttle came wide open right in the middle of the field. But what a hit. What? Cochran's goes to the right. Now you'll see Tuttle will be wide open in the middle. But what a hit by Don Wilson. I know Joe Farragelli last year talked about how physical Wilson is. We got an example of it there. Second down play. This is intercepted. DeWalt should not have thrown that because Don Wilson was the only man there and he makes the interception and lugs it out to about the 18 yard line. Well yeah Don you're exactly right. He should not have thrown that football. He had the wide receiver come in to the post and then back to the corner and he was covered like a blanket. He's, he's looking for him. He's not open. He pulls it down. He may as well have eat the ball. Got the three points out of it. But this is a big break for the Eskimos. Twice now the Bombers have had touchdowns called back. And they're going to escape this one with no points at all. Don Wilson was right on the spot. 155 remaining. And I wonder what thoughts are running through the head of head man Mike Riley on the Bomber bench. Winnipeg defensively all over Chris Johnston led by Mike Gray. What they need to do with 150 left is after this play call the timeout save some time and hope that Clark doesn't boom one and they'll get good field position and maybe get another chance before we go in at halftime. Well when you're a veteran quarterback like Roy you don't really need someone to tell you you shouldn't have thrown it. He knew he shouldn't have thrown that one. It's been a very difficult season for Roy to walk. He was expected to be the starter, the replacement in Winnipeg for Tom Clements, who retired. Things haven't worked out as planned. Winnipeg was hoping to stop Edmonton before they could pick up a first down, but Tom Richards is going to be very close. He's got it. Let's see where they spot the ball. They're going to give him a first down. He was up to the 28-yard line. Yeah, the chains moved immediately, so he must have been a long way across it. Now they got to hope for a turnover. 
an Edmonton player is down. It appears to be Tom Richards, and it is. Edmonton receivers have been taking a pounding today. First Marco Sincar, now Tom Richards. He's always had great speed. We saw him most of the time used as a kick returner. Sign makes some great plays from that position. And last week with eight receptions for over 200 yards, going to be a good slot back. And some tests the Eskimos have conducted on hand-eye coordination. He has also excelled. He's the best. That pass knocked down at the line of scrimmage. It falls incomplete. Three Winnipeg defenders were trying to go after it. Willie Fears got a hand on that throw by Damon Allen. The second time he has had a pass knocked down right at the line of scrimmage. That, that really frustrates a quarterback. Quarterbacks hate that. Well, you'll see him. They're right here on the bottom of the screen. He made the right read. He had his receiver open. But by the time he got the ball there, there's that big hand comes in from Willie Fears. Gets enough penetration to bat it in the air. 113 remaining in the half. Second down play for Edmonton. Allen trying to convert to the sidelines, and Tom Richards tried to make the catch. It's ruled that the ball bounced before he grabbed it. And they're very fortunate. They don't have to use their timeout. Still have 107 left. Maybe they can make something happen on the special teams. They've done it before. Third and 10, Edmonton. Let's take another look at the throw from Allen to Richards. Bootleg comes outside. Big play right here. Michael Gray kept it contained. He threw the ball. And he juggled it. It hit the ground on him. And a referee had great position to make the call. Let's check Corrick's hang time. Kicking into the wind. Excellent kick. Jefferson takes it back at the 40-yard line. He got a good block. It went right into the hands of Michael Allen, and it's bouncing away from him and recovered by the Eskimos. I, I think there was, there's a flag on the play anyway. When Jefferson ran with the football, when he got hit or whatever he did with the ball, it went it went forward into Allen's hand. That's what the flag was for. And then Allen fumbled the ball, and the Eskimos recovered. Benny Thompson threw a key block to. Spring Jefferson loose down the sidelines and the ball was fumbled by Jefferson right into the hands of Michael Allen. He in turn fumbled it and was knocked out of bounds by the Eskimos. Watch the block right here on number 34. Here comes Thompson to make the block. Excellent block. Now the ball just kind of flies up in the air as he tries to cut to see it went forward. So that's what the flag was for and then it, the ball came loose. They batted out of bounds. Their ball. That's a strange play. Things have not gone well for the Bombers in this opening half. They trail 14-1, and they had hopes with that punt return to get into possible scoring position. Instead, the Eskimos retain possession. And the Eskimos are going to try and run off the remaining seconds in this first half with Chris Skinner carrying the ball. Well, he got four yards with it. That, that should be Allen's best play because he likes to sprint out with the football and he gets it motion started that way and then hands off to Skinner. Right here, you see the ball. Allen running. McLean makes the hit. The ball bounces free. And number 95, Dan Kearns, who's been around a long time, those rules. I bat it out. It's my ball. Second down. Johnson will get the first down to the 51 yard line with 22 seconds remaining in the half. The Eskimos are starting to establish that ground game. You know, last week they had a great ground game against Ottawa. They had 561 yards of offense, 183 on the ground. So if they can get it going up front, Allen will hurt you in the air. Tom Richards goes out. Slater Zaleski back into the ball game for the Eskimos. Sandusky, the receiver wide to the right. Williams to the left. This could be the final play of the half. They may go for broke. Damon Allen throwing down the sidelines. It's knocked down. James Jeffers or Rod Hill knocked the pass down, and there's also a penalty flag at the line of scrimmage. The objectionable conduct call against Winnipeg. 
Time has run out, but with the penalty against the Bombers, the Eskimos will get another ploy. The flag came down real late. I mean, the ball had been gone and everything. I really didn't know what the flag was for, and then we find out somebody said something he shouldn't have. So the Eskimos get one more shot at trying to score before the half ends. At least that's what they attempted on what should have been the final play. They'll try it again in getting another play as a result of the penalty. It's complete on the sidelines to Zaleski, and Zaleski takes it out of bounds. There's another penalty flag at the line of scrimmage. Cross Perrier, the referee. And this time it's against the Edmonton Eskimos. Damon Allen had crossed the line of scrimmage before throwing the football. So the first half ends with the Eskimos in front by 13. For the first time in Canada, three new unleaded gasoline choices are coming your way. Petro Canada is introducing maximum unleaded gasolines. Three octane choices with superior engine cleaning capabilities for better performance. Choose regular grade maximum, intermediate grade maximum plus, or our highest octane grade maximum supreme. Petro Canada, bringing Canadian motorists the maximum. When they were little, they talked. And when they got a little older, they talked non-stop. But now, they've stopped talking. So where's this party at? When it comes to issues like alcohol and other drugs, it's not always easy. But you can help by keeping the conversation going. You're important to them, and your understanding means a lot. To help you talk with your kids about drugs, contact us for this free booklet. 1975 with the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and walking into the dressing room and there's uh, Garney Hanley standing there who's in his 16th season as a player. To me, as a kid growing up in Hamilton, this was a, this man was a living legend and I was actually on the same team as, as he was. And, and I hope for kids coming, growing up these days that they can look back on some of the players of today and, and uh, consider them legends and, and uh, have a good feeling and perception about the, these people as players and about the league. CBC Sports presents Inside the CFL. Edmonton in front of Winnipeg, 14 to 1 at the half, and welcome to Inside the CFL. He is 6 foot 5, 210 pounds, and he can throw the ball. He sounds like the prototype professional quarterback, but forget all that for a second. What we like best about Sean Salisbury of the Bombers is that he's got his priorities straight. He wants to be a broadcaster someday. He's graduated from uh, the University of Southern California in broadcast journalism. Perhaps we should uh, change positions here and let you conduct the interview. Oh, I'll leave that to you. My priority today is obviously on the football field. But yes, when, when my playing career is over and even before that, this offseason, I want to try to get into that. I worked at KTLA in Los Angeles during school, and it's a great opportunity and something I'd really like to get into. All right, what of the football field today, Sean? Uh, there wasn't much that went right in the first half of that game. Oh, we had a lot of penalties and a lot of mistakes. And we're just, uh, we just need to get a little on track. You know, we're only down 14 to 1, and it's a long game, and you, crazier things have happened. And we're right in this. We just need to compete and keep playing and keep our heads on straight, and we'll be all right. You were a successful quarterback at a major American school, USC, and as such, you had designs on playing in the NFL. When you dreamed of the NFL, had you ever even heard of Winnipeg? Um, I, yes, I had. I'd heard of the CFL, but I'd, all I'd ever seen was on ESPN, you know, watching on TV. And I never thought I'd ever end up here, but at the moment, I'm sure glad I am. It's an opportunity to play and to play with some good guys. When Indianapolis cut you in the first week, of this year's training camp there were a couple of other NFL teams that were interested why did you choose Winnipeg uh, an opportunity to play I got tired of, of standing around and being a third team quarterback I almost you start to doubt yourself and wondering if you're losing it and I just wanted to get in a situation where I could get some snaps and get some experience because uh, I've longed for that for uh, quite a while great advantage I suspect in knowing for the week that you were going to be the starting quarterback as opposed to last week when you had to go in on basically about 45 minutes notice sure I, you know, I just prepare the same way every game though whether I'm starting or not because I have a responsibility to my teammates and myself to, to get myself ready and and last week was a little bit of a surprise, but it worked out well, and hopefully we can keep going this week. You started in place of Tom Mickey last week. People would be surprised to learn that you guys are pretty good friends. Real good friends. I've known Tom for about four years, and it's just kind of ironic. We had the same attorney also, so it was kind of ironic how we ended up here together. And uh, he's quite a friend, and I'm sorry about his injury, and I think he'll come back fast. No quarterback likes to be taken out of a game. Uh, do you second-guess that decision uh, as no. far as you being removed in the uh, in the first half? No, they're, you know, they're trying to make
maybe get a little spark or get something going. I'm not too concerned with it. I just keep playing and keep competing. I'm not a second guesser. I just do what I can to help us win. All right, Sean Salisbury, thanks for joining us. We'll call this a successful audition. Thank you. As were Appreciate your first it. two games of your CFL career with the Bombers. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stay with us. Inside the CFL returns in just a moment. What? It's true. Canada Savings Bonds are early this year. Are they as flexible as ever? Oh, yes. Cashable any time and fully secure so they never fall in value. Just keep on growing. Buy yours by November 1st. Oh, what? Oh, you'll be late. Oh, dear. Too late. Oh, dear. For Canada Savings Bonds. On sale October 20th to November 1st. Welcome to a preview of that big Grey Cup Millions weekend. Let's go to the tape. Oh, they're prepping the cash for the winner of the Million Dollar Grey Cup Day draw. Just look at him getting ready to pay off the 50,000 winners in the Million Dollar Point Spread Pool. And okay, there's Russ the Jackson, you host of the 100 winners of the VIP Weekend to Grey Cup 88, going over plays with the party staff. It's proving to be a pigskin party of princely proportions, so get in the game today. I can't believe it! A young card shark pushes his luck too far. It's the all-new Danger Bay, tonight on CBC Television. Spike's pregnancy becomes an issue. Look, not all the parents want you to leave. Why can't they leave me alone? And Caitlin decides she has to change public opinion. Look, I can't allow this article to be published. Degrassi Junior High, tonight. Decades of memories crystallized on CBC. Remember 1955? Nice faking, and Johnny Bright is the ball carrier who gets that big hole and goes down the sideline. Hansen has a start at him. He's still going all the way. Still capturing the moments. The CFL on CBC. The Eskimos trying to regain sole possession of first in the West and leading through 30 minutes here in Winnipeg. Welcome back to Inside the CFL. When you talk about the Great Cup champion Eskimos, there's a tendency to focus on their offensive stars like Jim Sandusky and Gizmo Williams, but you should never overlook the leader of their defense, middle linebacker Dan Bass. Gord Miller reports for Inside the CFL. This is what Danny Bass does best. Hunt down quarterbacks as a middle linebacker for the Edmonton Eskimos. His play has drawn rave reviews this season and made him a strong candidate for a Shanley Award. But on this day, Bass is hunting with a quarterback, teammate Greg Vavra. Bass enjoying the outdoors like he has since his boyhood in Michigan. Oh, geez, I can remember that since uh, I was five or six years old. That's something that uh, my dad used to do a lot of hunting. And we used to carry our BB guns and uh, go out in the field with him and uh, try and hit a few pheasants. We never did, but that's something we've always done since I can remember. And Bass, the outdoorsman, has been helped by the locations of his CFL teams, spending most of his career in Alberta, an outdoorsman's paradise in any season. It's funny, when we first moved up here, uh, people thought we were crazy when they found out we were going to live up here and, and face the Edmonton winters, you know. It's just like people couldn't understand why we would even attempt to do that. But uh, so far, the winter's been really well. And we enjoy it. Like, uh, when I was a little kid, we've been brought up, you know, as far as snowmobiling and things like that. So, you know, I look forward to the different changes in weather. He hunts, fishes, and plays middle linebacker. Danny Bass would seem like a throwback to another time. But wife Karen knows better. He's a soft touch. He, he, he's not what everybody thinks he is. He actually, he likes being at home most and, and with his kids and his family. I feel very lucky. And the thing is, like, a lot of people look at, uh, I don't know, they look at a football player as being special or an athlete being special. I really don't consider that. I just feel that that's something I do for a living. I mean, one guy might be a doctor or a lawyer or a plumber. To me, that's what you do for a living. There's no difference between me and him. I just that I happen to be playing football. And this season, he's been playing football better than ever before. Winning the Grey Cup last season has only made Bass hungrier for another championship. You never had one before. You always think about, you know, that's the most important thing to get, and it is. And when you get it, 
you realize how important it is to you and like there's nothing else that can ever compare to it again. Like you know once you get one, you have to get one again and now I know why they, how the Evan Eskimos in the past got the five in a row. It's just something that you, know, you get one, you want one again and, and you just want to work a little bit harder for it. And that philosophy has served Danny Bass well as a football player, as a father, and even as a hunter. It seems that no matter where he is these days, on a football field or a farmer's field, Danny Bass has found his element. For Inside the CFL, I'm Gord Miller. A year ago, Dan Bass played probably the finest game of his pro career. Two interceptions, four quarterback sacks against the Bombers. One year later, Bass and the Eskimos are still making life miserable for the Bombers to the first half at least. Don? Well, Scott, in the first half, three touchdowns were scored. Only one of them counted, and that was a throw from Damon Allen to Jim Sandusky. Boy, what a nice touchdown it was. Damon Allen read the defense right. Sandusky made a great move on Rod Hill, the corner. He looked to the inside, and then he'll turn to the outside. Now, watch Damon. will throw the ball low into the outside, and if Sandusky doesn't catch it, nobody gets it. Nice catch by Sandusky. The Bombers had a lot of bad luck. That man, Mike Wicklam, watched the ball bobble around like a volleyball or an air in baseball. Finally, number 35 for Winnipeg is going to follow on the football on the 12-yard line. And again, the Bombers put it in the end zone on first down to Terry Cochran, and again, it didn't count. On second down, Roy DeWalt makes a bad error in judgment. He wants to throw the deep fly or the flag pattern to his receiver right here. He makes a bad mistake, gets it batted in the air, and Don Wilson makes an interception. And that's been the ball game. A touchdown and two mistakes by the Bombers. 14-1, the halftime score. And what do you think? Will the Bombers come back with Roy DeWalt or return to Sean Sal Salisbury? I think I'd give Salisbury another shot at it. He prepared all week. Let's stay with it. 14-1, the halftime score. The Edmonton Eskimos in front. Scott, back to you. Well, Don, the next game in our CFL on CBC schedule befits the stretch drive, which is to say there's a lot at stake. Second place will be on the line when the Bombers play the Tie Cats in Hamilton. We'll have the telecast beginning at 1 o'clock Eastern. Stay with us. They'll kick off the second half of this game between Edmonton and Winnipeg when we come back. You're watching the CFL on CBC, your Grey Cup network, coast to coast. Challenges you with Afterburner, a game so exciting you can imagine you're in for the fight of your life. Game and Master System sold separately. Afterburner gives you the real dogfight excitement of the arcade version. Yeah. Like barrel rolls, nose dives, supersonic speed, and radar lock-ons. Your turn up burn. Let's take it home. Afterburner, only on the Sega system. Sega, the challenge will always be there. This winter, don't get blown away by heating costs. Get a bulldog grip on home comfort with Pro 2000 and Draft Stop. Outside, Pro 2000 seals it all once and for all. While inside, Draft Stop seals out the breeze, then peels away in spring with ease. This winter, get a bulldog grip on home comfort with Pro 2000 and Draft Stop from Bulldog Grip. And stick with quality. Excuse me. Yes. What's going on? Ward Air now has this great business class, and it costs less than economy on this airline. Oh, thank you. So why are we flying this airline? I don't know. Why do they sit us beside each other? I don't know. Why are we whispering? The CFL on CBC. Brought to you by Carling O'Keefe, Brewers of Foster's Lager, the Golden Throat Charmer. Petro Canada Dealers and Agents, our energy is Canada. And by Priority Post EMS Courier, your better business connection in Canada and around the world. Well, through the first half of play, the Edmonton Eskimos had the ball for five minutes longer than the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and they also had a big edge in terms of first downs. Not a great advantage in passing yardage, but they certainly ran the ball better than Winnipeg. And Winnipeg, of course, uh, even though they were able to get the ball deep into Edmonton territory, 
were unable to put it in the end zone. Two of their touchdowns called back as the result of penalties. This game will conclude week 13 of the 1988 Canadian Football League season. Next week, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers will be in Hamilton. The Edmonton Eskimos will visit Calgary. Damon Allen returning to the Edmonton lineup. A very impressive first half. Well, you had to be impressed with the way he played. And as you know, we mentioned in the opening, will he be willing to take off and run with a football? The one run that he made down to about the four yard line, he, I thought for sure he'd hit the deck, but he did. He cut back, took a couple hits. So he's back. Well, the Bombers will have the wind at their back for this third quarter. James Jefferson on this kickoff return. Reverses his field. He needs a couple of blocks. Gets outside Junior Robinson, but then Robinson recovers and makes the tackle. Well, when you come down to that outside position on the kickoff, you're usually the guy that has to contain it. If he gets inside outside, you do better catch him. Well, Roy DeWalt continues to throw at the Winnipeg bench, but as Ron Lancaster suggested, Sean Salisbury is coming back to start this third quarter. Well, I said that because if you're going to prepare all week with the guy and you want him to be the starter, he's young, give him another chance. If he doesn't get it going, then we'll see DeWalt. Salisbury throws complete. Terry Cochran was driven back after picking up maybe a yard on the catch. It's been a frustrating day for Terry Cochran. Young product out of the Regina Ram Jr. system and he had those two touchdowns called back in the first half as we referred to. Well the main thing he's got to be pleased about is getting the opportunity to play the position that he always wanted to play and that's running back. He's worked with a slot back with the Bombers but you know he'd love to have at least one of those touchdowns and I know the Bombers would have liked to have seen it. The throw behind slot back Perry Tuttle so Winnipeg will be forced to kick. He made the right read. He got the man coverage underneath. The linebacker ran out with Cocker and he just threw it behind Tuttle. He's got to get that ball down inside a little quicker. Bob Cameron will be trying to drive this one deep into Edmonton territory. Interestingly enough, neither kicker, Cameron or Corrick, with the wind, has really been able to hit one. Usually it's because of the wind is so strong that if you don't hit it just right, it drives it right back down. They've had better success kicking against it where it's hung up in the air for them. This time Cameron gets away a beauty. Williams all the way back to his own five yard line. The tackle was made by Ken Petway after Terry Cochran made the initial hit. Had Williams been able to get away from Cochran, I think he was gone. Well, I thought he was gone anyway because he's got such great speed and tackling him in open field is tough. Look at that thing open up. Now he gets to use that speed. Cochran, you'll see number 31, gets a little bit of a hit on him and then Petway finishes him before he's tough to bring down in open field. That's his second big return. He had a 46-yard run back in the first half. This one for 40 yards after a 61-yard Bob Cameron kick. Edmonton trying to keep that ground game intact as the gizmo relaxes over on the sidelines. You know, he's got to be awful happy, too, to be starting as a receiver. He gets to play something there where he wants to play. He likes returning kicks, but I know he likes catching passes, too. Not a bad average. 43 yards on two returns. Second and six. Passes behind Chris Skinner. And the Edmonton Eskimos are forced to kick. Making Allen read it a little different now. Instead of James West chasing the back out into the flat, Benny Thompson just stands out there and they play inside, outside, and it doesn't give Allen anywhere to throw the football to. There's an injured Edmonton player, Dave Richardson, the offensive guard. May have uh, caught a finger in the face. Uh, he was initially holding his head. That's been a common problem this year among many offensive linemen. Well, we've seen a lot of guys get fingers in the eye. I really don't know why all of a sudden it started, but I can certainly see why there are more than those bites. Richard. 
Richardson now heading off to the Edmonton bench as the punt team moves out there with 1234 remaining wherever you're looking in this Thanksgiving Day afternoon we hope you're enjoying the action from Winnipeg Stadium Tarek had to feel that low snap and running out of the pocket he gets the kick away it's fumbled by Winnipeg but then recovered as Jeff Smith took the ball back at the 35 yard line Corrick did a good job to get that kick away G'day. I've asked Ricky here to teach me the barman's art of pouring a perfect Foster's lager single-handed. How am I going so far? Not bad. This technique allows you to put the squeeze on the golden throat charmer with one hand, while you're putting the squeeze on a charming lady with the other. What more could a man ask for? Another arm, maybe. Foster's, the golden throat charmer. How is Priority Post EMS Career better connected? Through an experienced national network with reliable next business day delivery most everywhere in Canada and all the choice, convenience, and price features you'll ever need through better connections to the U.S. And through the EMS Career Network, better connected to Europe and to over 60 countries right around the world. Priority Post EMS Courier, Canada's better business connection. I mean, you dream about winning championships, and, and the Grey Cup's the ultimate when it comes to football in Canada. It's wide open, uh, it's fast, uh, it, it can change at any moment. It's more exciting, I find, in the NFL, and I've watched both. It's just such a great feeling to know that your name will always be on that Grey Cup, and you'll have a ring to show all your friends, family, your kids when you grow up to say that, yeah, you know, I, not only did I play in the CFL, but I was on a winning team and, and actually had a chance to participate in the Grey Cup. Watch the snap from center. It's a little bit low and bounce, and he bobbles it. Now, Ron Hill's coming from the outside. It's his job to make sure he steps up inside. He's a good job of kicking on the run by Carrick, and then Jeff Smith catches it, fumbles it, but he does recover it, and the Bombers get possession of it. But I think Carrick made a decision that rather than give him a chance to block it, I'll get out of it. Whistle had gone on the play prior to Salisbury stepping back out of the pocket. Is it a time count violation? No, you you can't start the game until the referee blows the whistle. When the referee blows the whistle, you can start. He called the signals before the referee said the time was in. Okay, they'll try it again then. First and ten. The ball just shy of the 35-yard line. 14-1, the Edmonton Eskimos in front of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Sideline pattern, and that's a first down for Winnipeg as James Murphy is taken out of bounds up at the 50-yard line. That's a pretty nice throw by Salisbury. He made a good fake, and as he turned outside, Larry Ruck saw him, and he came to force it. Salisbury just kind of hesitated a second, flipped that sidearm, and when Murphy turned around, the ball was there. First and ten from the 50. Winnipeg apparently has abandoned the running game. Catch is made by Jeff Smith. There was some doubt, I'm sure, in everyone's mind, including Jeff Smith, before he finally went to the ground with the football. Well, you know, you hear him talk about touch. Touch means getting the ball into some weird places. Watch the ball just get over the top. He had tunnel going deep. Now he lays it over top of Larry Ruck. I thought for sure Ruck was going to intercept it. Just gets over his head. Smith probably didn't even see it coming. Well, this is Cannon. I said Winnipeg appeared to have abandoned the running game. They had no success in the first half. They toss to Cannon, and he picks up about seven yards. And that's an indication as to why Salisbury has been throwing the ball more than attempting to get it to the running backs. Way, okay. They've managed just 12 yards in this game, and they really haven't had much success in any game during the season in running with the football. Oh, throwing deep. Incomplete. Intended for James Murphy along the sidelines. Would have been a heck of a catch that he made to catch it all. Murphy went down. I think they wanted to throw the out, the quick out, get the first to 10, but they were right up on him, so he took it deep. Made the quick pump, 
and he lays it to the sidelines and then the wind carries but watch Murphy jump turn in the air gets his hands on it but when Benjamin hits him he just couldn't hold on it's a good effort by Murphy Murphy has made some acrobatic catches this season and he certainly did his best to haul in that throw from Sean Salisbury but it's now third and three and Trevor Kenner who missed on his only field goal try so far in the game will attempt another from 41 yards up. This time it's good. So with 958 remaining in the third quarter it's 14 4 coming into the game Kenner had been good on 75 percent of his field goal tries. We saw Sean Salisbury just on that third down turn and looking to the sideline to Mike, Mike Riley hoping for the signal to go after it on third down and three or third down and four. But as tough as yards are to get against the Eskimos you better take what you can get get the points on the board. Well there are some coaches who have always believed in the theory that you take points whenever they're available. I, I agree with that because you never know if you get a turnover that three becomes ten in a hurry. Marco Simcar on the receiving end at the 42 yard line and Ken Petway brought him down. I'll tell you one thing about the catch that Simcar has made today that he has got hit just as the ball has gotten there. You can't get there any faster than Petway did but Simcar has held on to him. He's been around for a long time a 1979 territorial exemption of the Edmonton Eskimos went to Hamilton in 1980 back to Edmonton in 1981 product of the University of Alberta and he's been a key receiver in this game this afternoon second and about a yard and a half and they'll get it with Chris Johnstone up across the 45. Yeah he had to get to the 45 and by the mark that I see from the official he's just across it so that'll be the first down. Eight forty seven remaining in the third quarter. Both teams have preferred the pass to the run although the Edmonton Eskimos have more balance in their attack than Winnipeg. A little bit more I think that's helped them. They stay in the ground. Chris Skinner is out across the 50 stopped at the 52 yard line. When you can run the football and get seven to eight yards you'll run a lot and that's a little just about seven yards for him would put your offense in a good position for second down. Well the Eskimos have five Canadian running backs all five can play with any team in the CFL they're using Chris Skinner and Chris Johnson this afternoon they've also got Blake Marshall Brian Walling Tony Spalatini. Not bad. No shortage of them and they're all good. Johnson again for another Edmonton first down to the Winnipeg 53 yard line. It's something the Eskimos are doing here in this third quarter. They're chewing up the clock going against the wind. Yeah watch that offensive line come up. They just come bang make the contact then Johnstone runs wherever he wants to go. Great battle has to come in from that outside linebacker position to make the hit. Just try to get a little bit of movement let the back pick his hold. 732 remaining in the third quarter the Bombers wanted to score some points with the wind at their backs but they need the football the Eskimos have got it. sideline pattern Rod Hill knocked it away from Jim Sandusky or vice versa Sandusky made a pretty good play getting that hand in there they gambled on it thought it was going to be a zone Hill stayed right with him and he turned around he had a better chance at it than Sandusky Bombers had a pretty good cornerback the last couple of seasons by the name of Roy Bennett he went down to the National Football League. Cal Murphy was telling us today that he figures that Rod Hill is better at man-to-man -man coverage, one-on-one -on -one situation than Roy Bennett. Well, I tell us just like I told Cal, I thought Bennett was pretty good, though. So that is high praise indeed. There's a penalty flag. This will be a holding call by the Eskimos. It will be brought back and upset at the fact he was held. Face, face mask. Is Dan Wicklow. Well there's been a little battle going on over there with Michael Gray and the offensive lineman of the Eskimos so maybe it got a little bit out of hand but we saw Petway fall down on that particular coverage and that's why Sinkar was so wide open. Major foul face mask Edmonton number 51. Dave Richardson is the Eskimo guilty of that face mask call. 
Peyton Hendler Lure. I didn't see him grab it, but he must have grabbed it. He was just trying to go by. If you beat that offensive line, he's going to do anything he can to slow you down, reach out and grab you, and sometimes you grab the face mask. And he got caught. I saw that flag fly, and I thought it was a holding call, but it was a face mask violation, no question about it. Second and 25. Time count violation. Time count violation, Edmonton number nine. I was watching Eskimo receivers. They switched Sint Carr and Henry Webb in motion, put Williams inside, one on one with the halfback. Looked like a blitz. Let's see if they do it again because that's going to make an awful tough one, Pat Ray. Second and 30, the drop play. Penalty flag again. This will probably be your holding call, Don, because if it came from the official behind the line. I said that the Eskimos had tremendous depth at that Canadian running back position. Brian Walling into the ball game for the first time, walking the ball that time. Brock Plant at that time was called for holding. Just the draw play up the middle, let him read. They call Rod Conniff, the offensive center, for grabbing Fears, who's the guy that plays across from him. Walling's a fire plug at about 5'8 and 190 pounds out of Acadia. Been around a little bit, signed with Miami, then to, to the Toronto Argonauts, and finally to the Eskimos. Second and 40. Michael Gray in pursuit of Damon Allen. So with 6.02 remaining in the third quarter, the Edmonton Eskimos are forced to kick it away. He had nothing downfield. Rod Hill was with Sandusky step for step. As he turned the corner, he wasn't going to be able to run for 40 yards because of Michael Gray. He just threw it to the Eskimo bench. Let's see if they make the sticks with the punt. <laughs> he doesn't hit it off as good. Well, they started this series at the Winnipeg 54-yard line. So Carrick has to kick this ball to the 44 to get it back to where the Eskimos were trying to advance it. He does it, and it's picked up by Jefferson, and Winnipeg will have the first down at the Edmonton 42-yard line. 5.39 is the time remaining in the third quarter. Don't be late. There's a new day of what? It's true. Canada Savings Bonds are early this year. Are they as flexible as ever? Oh, yes. Cashable any time and fully secure so they never fall in value. Just keep on growing. Buy yours by November 1st. Oh, what? Oh, you'll be late. Oh, dear. Too late? Oh, dear. For Canada Savings Bonds. On sale October 20th to November 1st. If you could read my mind, you could see the truth. You're taking chances if you drink and drive. Now it's up to you. It's too late. Once you start, it's never too late. The location is brand new, the technology the most up-to-date, and the people at Hector M. Chisholm and Company are moving with the times to bring you the same dynamic results they always have. Results that stem from a tried and true way of doing business. The president, Mr. George Chisholm, and his associates work from the floor of the new exchange every trading hour of every trading day. So put yourself in the best place to be in the stock market on the inside with Hector M. Chisholm and Company. Joe Farragelli walking back and forth in front of that Edmonton bench, and he has to be concerned the fact that his Eskimos were unable to move the football on the last series, even though they started out as though they were going to take a lot of time off that clock. And now he sees the Winnipeg Blue Bombers first and 10 at the Edmonton 53-yard line. Penalty flag again. That ball initially brought back to the 42-yard line on the punt return by James Jefferson. But there was an objectionable conduct call against Winnipeg. 
So as a result, the Bombers were backed up, and Brett Williams got to quarterback Sean Salisbury. Top five, Edmonton number 96. First down repeated. But it will go for not as Winnipeg will have a first and five situation as the result of the offside call against Alex Carter. He got started, and when he moved, it created a scene, and that allowed Brett Williams to get into that fast. He just did, he didn't beat his guy that quick. They were outside. Salisbury inside the Randy Fabi first down Winnipeg at the 34. Well, he's been trying to throw that all day. He finally got it in the right place at the right time. Just as Fabi ducked in under number six, Tony, the ball hit him right in the chest. He got the inside step, watch the ball, couldn't have been thrown any better. Hit him right on the numbers, he spun away from Warren, picked up some pretty good yardage. Despite the fact that he's been under some pressure, Sean Salisbury has remained quite composed out there. Throwing deep for Perry Tuttle, over his head. Well, he hooked the backside receiver, in this case, number 80, Jeff Smith, to hold Benjamin. And that gives Perry Tuttle one-on-one -on -one coverage with Tony down the sidelines. He just threw it too far. Salisbury continues to glance over at that Winnipeg bench looking for a little help in play selection. Not uncommon for a young quarterback. Yeah, Roy DeWalt stands out. He stands by Mike Riley, and then he signals the play in. Gets it away with about two seconds remaining on the 22nd block. The pass is complete. Perry Tuttle comes go. Yards, pretty good stats, but he hasn't scored. This time he finds it across the middle and he gets the job done. High snap, but Cameron hauls it down and Trevor Kennard puts it through. We've got a brand new ball game at Winnipeg Stadium with the Eskimos in front by just three. You're gonna like new Foster's draft. It's great beer, it's fresh out of the keg, but the best thing is. You gotta go out to get it. Foster's Lager, now on tap. Go out and get it. Get a university degree paid for. Study history. Physics. Medicine. Engineering, name it. Join students like these who are getting a university degree, a salary, and that important first job, all paid for by the Canadian Armed Forces. Want a degree and a future? We're under recruiting in the yellow pages. Choose a career. Live the adventure. October 16th, Mike Riley takes his Winnipeg Blue Bombers to Iverwind Stadium in Hamilton, hoping to solidify second place in the East. Earl Winfield, with five kick returns for touchdowns, will be a major threat for the Tiger Cats. Capturing the moments. The CFL on CBC. Winnipeg at Hamilton, Sunday, October 16th at 1 o'clock Eastern. For Perry Tuttle, his eighth touchdown of the season. He's had pretty good production this year. One touchdown for about every four catches. That's good. And throw three to somebody else, hit him with the fourth one. <laughs> yep. For 11 is the time remaining in this third quarter. Here comes the gizmo again. And this time he doesn't get away from that coverage team. Vernon Paul was the first man downfield after a 22-yard run back. Well, we'll take a look. Salisbury, you're going to see him coming right across the middle from right to left on your screen. Tuttle right over the middle, makes the catch, and then he's got that thing that all receivers need, and that's speed. He just outruns them to the end zone. Wilson couldn't catch it. He goes in standing up. 
good speed. He gets outside. Koenig's giving up. Wilson's going to try to catch him. No chance. So Tuttle will touch down number eight. But Perry Tuttle almost committed a grievous error there. He almost started celebrating before he reached the end zone. Yeah, make sure you cross that last white line before you start to put the ball up in the air. Or somebody will take it off of it. Vernon Paul is the injured Winnipeg Blue Bomber. Well, you set that wedge return up in the middle of the football field, and somebody, somebody has got to break the wedge. Here comes Vernon Paul. Runs right into Larry Ruck. Just dives into it. That's the way you break those wedges. Dive into it. There's nowhere to run. You're supposed to pay the price for it, as we found out. First and ten, and the pitch goes to Chris Skinner trying to get outside, and he's brought down after a gain of about a yard and a half. Good pursuit by linebacker James West. You know what you see going on right now is the, the crowd has finally gotten into the ball game, and they're causing problems for the Eskimos. When they come out over the ball, they start hollering and screaming, and everybody goes right in the middle to listen. There's the toss outside. Aaron Brown coming from that inside position just sort of runs him down and when he turns in they're there to hit him and James West the other inside linebacker jumps on his back. Second and eight for the Edmonton Eskimos defensively the Bombers have played well this afternoon led by that man James West. Yeah very few ball carriers outrun James West around the outside. He's got tremendous speed for an inside linebacker. But here go the crowd watch him start hollering. Over the middle to Tom Richards for an Edmonton first down. And he gets up and uh, shoves Benny Thompson, and Thompson is infuriated. That was kind of a delayed reaction on the part of Tom Richards. Thompson likes to hit people, and he probably said something to him. And he got up and shoved them, and that's why he wasn't pulling. They felt he should have had a penalty. Richards goes to the bench. Zaleski comes into the ball game. Here's a reverse with the gizmo. Penalty flag goes down. We're going to get a holding call on the wide receiver as well as where the flag is thrown in that vicinity. Could be Jim Sandusky who was guilty of a holding call as Williams tried to turn that corner. Well, it's against Edmonton, no indication yet as to whether it was Sandusky, but it appeared as though he was the guilty party. Holding Edmonton number seven, first down the field. On that play, when Williams comes in motion down the line of scrimmage, the wide receiver comes in to block the halfback. He's normally the force man, and Sandusky grabbed him. 225 oh, remaining in the third the quarter. The other way. 26,298 taking in this Thanksgiving Day game at Winnipeg Stadium. Here comes the blitz by James West. He didn't get through. And the ball carrier, Chris Skinner, gets up to the 45-yard line. There's another penalty fly. First down. First down. Major follow. Face mask, Winnipeg number 53, first down. Well, that's a bad one. That takes the ball to the 50 yard line. The call against veteran Aaron Brown. Well, we'll take a look at it from the reverse angle. You see Aaron Brown being blocked. He reaches out, grabs Skinner, and he got him by the face mask. That gives him a first down. That's the bad part of it. In and out of the arms of Stefan Jones. I think that's the first time they've gone to Jones this afternoon. Well, he's been the designated import today, so he's been, he was injured a couple of games ago. He hasn't played a whole lot. Henry Williams has been playing a wide receiver. He makes the white right read. You see the receiver's covered in the flat. It's a hook pattern deep. It's thrown outside of him, but very, very catchable. One thirty five remaining in the third quarter three points separating the Eskimos they lead the Bombers.
Rod Hill over on the sidelines covering Slater Zaleski. Uh, once again, you can't ask the quarterback to throw it any better. He stepped into the pocket, threw it hard, right on the money, and he gets hit. Watch, you might as well catch it. You're going to get hit anyway. Ball's right there. Ball hits him in the hands, and then Hill and Thompson hit him. Carrick kicking into the wind. Another good kick. Jeff Smith fields it at the 15 yard line. Nowhere to go. He's down immediately at the 18. First man downfield was Mark Norman. Smith started the year with the Toronto Argonauts. He was part of the Jeff Boyd trade. When he came to Winnipeg, he initially was employed as a slot back. In the last couple of games, they shifted him to a wide receiver. We'll see the Winnipeg Blue Bombers again next weekend on Sunday afternoon. They'll be at Iverwind Stadium to take on the Tie Cats. That could be a battle for second place in the Eastern Division. Salisbury throwing deep, and it's out of bounds. Cliff Tony was defending against James Murphy. Well, Benjamin had him up close in the zone, and then Cliff Tony sitting deep. Try to hit that spot between the corner and the halfback. Tony makes a good play to get over there and get that hand in there. Almost intercepted, but Murphy, if he catches that one, he's gone. 45 seconds remaining in the third quarter. Winnipeg, second and 10. Draw play with Cannon, and he has stopped at the 21 yard line. So with 26 seconds remaining in the quarter, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers will be kicking with the win. And they would like a big one here from Bob Cameron. Of course, both times that Cameron has really hit that football, the gizmo has returned him. That's the big thing. If he hits it good with the win, it's going to go in the air a long way, and that's when you start to outkick your coverage, and it allows Williams time to wind up. Bounces to the gizmo at the 40 yard line. He runs into one of his own players and attempting to dodge a downfield tackler. And with one second remaining, the Eskimos will have at least one play before this third quarter ends. Well, on Sunday, November 27th, in the nation's capital, the 1988 Grey Cup game takes place. And we'll have it all for you on CBC television beginning at 1 o'clock Eastern Time with our countdown show. So stay with us throughout the balance of the regular season and through the playoffs, including the Grey Cup game on CBC Television, your Grey Cup Network. Damon Allen will run it out of bounds on the final play of the third quarter. So the Edmonton Eskimos will attempt to protect a three-point lead with 15 minutes remaining. When Honda introduced the remarkable third-generation Accord sedan, it quickly became a leader in owner loyalty. And now it has achieved the status of Canada's most preferred automobile, which leads us to suggest there are few things in life more loyal than a Honda Accord owner. Ontario, get ready to get happy. You can play Winterio with an instant win every week. Now anytime you want to have a happy thought, think Winterio when the ticket you got. And it's easy to play. Whatever you do win, wherever you go, remember to play Winterio. There'll be winners everywhere. Remember to play Winterio. And it's so much fun. Remember to play Winterio with an instant win every week. Play Winterio. Daytime, nighttime. Sunday, CBC Television takes you to the movies. There's no doubt about it. I want to shout about it. It's a new season of excitement. We got a feeling going for each other, yeah. Happy birthday, my love. 
The CBC Sunday Night Movie. Daytime. Nighttime. CBC is fine. The Edmonton Eskimos are facing second and six to start the fourth quarter from their own 47-yard line. But now they have the advantage of that following win. Although it has shifted a little and appears to be more of a crosswind. Edmonton picks up the blitz. Damon Allen throwing for the sidelines. And he threw it out of bounds looking for the gizmo. Well, he put that slot back on this side of the field. And Winnipeg brought Petway over here. It's one on one with Jefferson. And Jefferson won the battle. With that excellent coverage on it. Allen just threw it away. James Jefferson has certainly developed into one of the premier defensive backs into the CFL. Low snap to Cowrick. Rod Hill was going after it, but he didn't get there in time. Jeff Smith takes it back at the 18-yard line. And Smith is stopped right at the 22. So that's where Winnipeg will scrimmage first and 10. A 46-yard kick by Jerry Carr. This program is copyrighted and is strictly for the private use of our audience. Any reproduction, retransmission, or exhibition in whole or in part without the written consent of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is strictly prohibited. Salisbury, who gave way to Roy DeWald in the second quarter, has gone all the way in the second half. So it's complete to Randy Fabi, and that will produce a gain of about six, maybe seven yards. Well, Salisbury's not the quickest quarterback in the world, but he maneuvered himself just enough to allow Fabi to buy some time and get open, and then he hit him with the football. Fabi is favoring his back as he returns to the huddle. Okay, watch him. As he stands in there, now he has to do a little bit of movement. Moves those feet, hits him. Now watch Fabi take the hit in the back. That's a pretty good tackle by Stuart Hill, but Fabi took that hit in the back of the defender. Second and three. Cannon looking for the first down. He's got it. Well, that's a good effort on Cannon's part because where he wanted to go, there was nothing. He bounced it outside and finally got the first down. That's a good job. The injured Winnipeg player could be Randy Faby. We saw him take that hit on the previous play where he took the throw from Salisbury for a gain of seven yards. He went back to the huddle holding his back. And this could be the result of that hit. Well, you saw right away the trainer grabbed it, has it grab his hand grabbed it and you don't you know you know that he's functioning properly and now they're checking his neck when you're Fabi size you come in there to block on those big defensive linemen you take a heck of a shot to the head every time you block them you know we have talked about Ed McWhorters being the son of a former Saskatchewan star and Slater Zaleski the son of a former Winnipeg Blue Armor coach Joe Zaleski oh well, Randy Fabi is the son of a, another teammate another. of yours of another era, Martin yeah. Fabi. I would imagine we'll probably see Martin next week in Hamilton. Yeah, we could probably do uh, an interesting assessment of some second generation players in the Canadian Football League in this 1988 season. Seems to be okay. They was checking his deck. He took a pretty good hit in the head. Slot backs aren't the biggest guys in the world to block those big defensive linemen. Thirteen, eighteen remaining in the ball game. First and ten. Salisbury drops it underneath the Perry Tuttle. He'll have an eight-yard gain, maybe nine. That's a good play. They bring Cannon out of the backfield, and then all Tuttle does is allow him to go by right here. Allows him to go, and then he comes right in underneath him and catches the football. Turns up field, gets on the ground. So he talked about slot back block, and Perry Tuttle said, what, I asked him what the funniest thing he saw in football was, he said block. His blocking ability. <laughs> if he plays that slot back, sometimes you have to do it. He managed to pick up nine at second and one. The pitch to Cannon, he'll have 
to struggle to get a first down. I don't think he's going to get there as he was wrestled down by Larry Ruck. Well, I'd say they're a little bit short. Might be close enough to go get it if they're not. Well, they signal first down. I'm trying to look at that thing across. I think they'd have had to go get it, but it was going to be close. That's only the second first down our statistician Sim Simone informs in this second half. Winnipeg well below their seasonal rushing average. Salisbury was looking for Baby, I think, and the ball was deflected. I guess if you're open when you come off the line of scrimmage, you look for the football, and then Baby and Murphy's decision, they weren't open, and they really weren't, but Salisbury drilled it in there. 12 minutes remaining. Edmonton leading. 14 11. They also have a big advantage in first downs. This one is knocked down at the line of scrimmage by Brett Williams. He did get a good pass rush, but he was on the line of scrimmage and he got those big hands up, knocked them down. You think a quarterback standing 6 5 wouldn't have any trouble throwing over those defensive linemen, but. Williams is a big man, 6'3, 260 pounds, and he got that hand up. That's always been a little misconception, you know, the height of a quarterback. It's not his height, it's how deep he gets in the lanes. All quarterbacks throw through lanes. That's why they rush the defensive ends wide. You throw inside him, and if you don't, that's what's going to happen to you. Well, you're one who can certainly confirm that height isn't absolutely <laughs> necessary to play quarterback. Probably threw out of a hole. Cameron's kick into the wind takes the bounce back towards the line of scrimmage and is taken out of bounds by Don Wilson and the Edmonton Eskimos for their offensive series will have excellent field position. Only a 20 yard kick. I just enjoy working with the kids. You can bring a smile to their face, or you can, you, I can get such a chuckle out of them. Some of the questions that they ask, uh, everything from uh, what do you think of the financial affairs of the CFL from a, a seven year old to uh, how much food does Hector really eat? It's, it's just fun. It's not something I'm obligated to do. I just think it's, it's a great experience. As simple as that. Howard, how come light beer from Miller is your favorite light beer? Oh, man, the taste is obop shabam. I mean, lay down, break down, birdie on the hot side of town. You dig? I dig. Miller Light. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. The Eskimos are first and 10 at their own 51-yard line. Well, have we got a treat for you coming up on Wednesday, October 19th. You're accustomed to seeing Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday nights, but we have a special edition, the Los Angeles Kings at the Edmonton Oilers, Wednesday, October 19th, on the full CBC television network. And Wayne Gretzky, of course, off to a blazing start with the Los Angeles Kings. Ten points in three victories that the Kings have posted. The Edmonton Oilers off to a pretty good start as well, winning their first two games. And you'll see the return of the great one to the Northlands Coliseum live on Wednesday, October 19th on Hockey Night in Canada. Skinner can't get away as he is brought down by a blitzing James West. I was looking at that defense of Winnipeg and the way they were playing it. I thought this is a great call against the Virginia West came right up through the middle. If you can get around the corner, boy, there's a lot of room, but look at West. He sat in that position, and when he saw the handoff, he came right in behind the lineman. You saw Trevor Bowles pulling across. West waited till he cleared, and then he used that speed to make the tackle in the backfield. On second and 15, Greg Battle and Michael Allen come out. Ken Haley and Paul Flatney go in for Winnipeg defensively. Here's the blitz again, and Benny Thompson makes the tackle. Well, you know, they like to do a lot of things with Benny Thompson, but you want your regulars in the game when you do it. That's about the first time we've seen him come on a safety blitz right up the middle, and he timed it perfectly. Watch him come right up between the center and guard. No chance at all for Bercheval, Pierre Bercheval, the right guard. Benny Thompson there for his seventh sack. Third and 20 now. 
James Jefferson is deep back at the 15. Jeff Smith stands at the 35 yard line for Winnipeg. There appeared to be movement at the line of scrimmage prior to the ball being snapped, but there was no penalty flag. Jefferson having difficulty with the kick. He's forced out of bounds back at the Winnipeg 19 yard line. 10 09 is the time remaining in the ball game. Braun brings you freedom from the ordinary with built in electronics for cordless shaving. Braun System 123, full cordless power for a faster, smoother shave. A closer, comfortable shave, even on difficult areas. Precision control for sideburns or mustache. Braun System 123, rechargeable power, exceptional performance. Don't be late. There's a new day. A what? It's true. Canada Savings Bonds are early this year. Are they as flexible as ever? Oh, yes. Cashable any time and fully secure so they never fall in value. Just keep on growing. Buy yours by November 1st. Oh, what? Oh, you'll be late. Oh, dear. Too late? Oh, dear. For Canada Savings Bonds. On sale October 20th to November 1st. Making good things happen together. We're doing it, you and me. The lottery's helping, making it grow. It's a good, good feeling. The Ontario Lottery Corporation. Together. Three points in the ball game with 10.07 remaining in the fourth quarter. Winnipeg first and 10 from the 19-yard line. Salisbury's in trouble. He throws it away, but he was in the grasp of Larry Ruck, and they'll rule that he was down back at the five-yard line. Trying to set up a screen with three receivers at a wide side. Want to throw a screen short side. Screen was covered. Watch how fast Larry Ruck comes in from his linebacker position. Well, I guess a few others did too. Stuart Hill was there. They ruled him down on the six, so he didn't have to go all the way back to the two. Saskatoon Hilltop grad Larry Ruck making the fifth sack of the afternoon for the Edmonton Eskimos, and Cannon has absolutely nowhere to go as. Stuart Hill was there, and so is Danny Bass, and now there's a penalty flag. A late call, and Chris Walby is in the middle of it, along with a couple of Edmonton Eskimos, so let's wait for referee Ross Perrier to sort this one out for us. Major foul, face mask. Winnipeg number 63, third down. Well, the big man in Winnipeg's offensive line takes a second costly penalty. 6'7, 290 pounds. You talked about you don't want to take those costly penalties going into the other team's end zone or coming out of your own territory deep, and Walby has been guilty both ways. Both times. They're, they're not real smart penalties to take. That's a great kick, though. Cameron kicking out of the end zone to Henry Williams. And again, he runs into one of his own men. Brett Williams was trying to do some blocking for him, but it's also tough to uh, knock people down when you're not quite sure which direction the gizmo is going. That's right. You don't really know where he's going. He was doing a lot of stutter stepping back and forth. And when he finally decided to go and made his move, he went right into Brett Williams. A 41-yard kick, a five-yard return by the gizmo. He lines up in that wide receiver position. Jim Sandusky heads out to the other side. Here's the reverse with the gift mark. Rob Hill played it very well. Played it perfect. He just stayed outside. Ken Haley came over, and the gizmo was knocked into the kicking net that the Bombers have on their sidelines. They spot the ball right at the 38-yard line, which was the line of scrimmage. What'd you say? Watch Rod Hill. Look, he sits on the outside, stays on the outside. 
When he tries to go around him, he gets enough of him to hold him up, and then Haley comes in to finish him, and they end up in that tennis thing. Now, he tried to hold him up, but he couldn't do it. He fell right into the kicking net. 8.21 is the time remaining. Penalty flag movement at the line of scrimmage by Winnipeg. And now Damon Allen will take off. And he stopped at the 31-yard line. Offside against Winnipeg. There was premature movement on the left side of the defensive line. Offside, Winnipeg number 52. Michael Gray, the left defensive end, jumped early. From our reverse angle, let's take a look at him. There he is. He's inside that zone. He's trapped. Good. Good job by the center. Snap the ball when he gets in there. He can't get out. And they did, so they get a second and five. Here comes the blitz with Rodanovic coming from the back side. The pass knocked down by Rod Hill. When you take that quick rollout into the short side, and the, the opposition, in this case, Winnipeg, sitting in a zone, you better throw it quick. Rod Hill almost got that one. Third and five, Edmonton, as Corrick comes into the ball game to attempt a 40-yard field goal. 14-11 is the score, the Eskimos leading. Edmonton trying to break out of a first-place tie in the West with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The kick is good. So it was 7:29 remaining in the game. The Eskimos lead it by six. Take more than that to get me. We're gonna win it, though. You've just been invited by Fosters to a friendly game of footy. That's football for real men. Sleep. Aussie rules, mate. It's a riot. No timeout, no pads, no penalties. Ooh. Just 100 minutes of bone crushing action from two of the best teams in the world. So watch where you're going. And don't miss out on the Fosters Cup final Sunday, October 16th. Tickets at Ticketmaster. Purity has its mark. With gold. It's stamped right in. In Canada, another symbol for purity is HT. Found on HT lubricants from Petro Canada, the only lubricants formulated from a base oil that's 99% pure. HT lubricants from Petro Canada for your farm, business, or vehicles. Your assurance of quality that's as good as gold. When they were little, they talked. And when they got a little older, they talked non-stop. But now, they've stopped talking. So where's this party at? When it comes to issues like alcohol and other drugs, it's not always easy. But you can help by keeping the conversation going. You're important to them, and your understanding means a lot. To help you talk with your kids about drugs, contact us for this free booklet. Following the Jerry Corrick field goal, it has moved Edmonton in front by six. Winnipeg scrimmaging from the 35. The throw deep for James Murphy. He makes the catch. How did he grab that one? He had double coverage. Sometimes you get a little bit lucky. Salisbury threw this ball off balance, leaning backwards and got up into that wind and started cluttering. Murphy came back. He made the play. It had nothing to do with the throw. What Salisbury has to move. <laughs> See him off balance, that ball gets up in that wind, and Murphy just comes back underneath both defenders and out jumps him for the football. That's a good play by James Murphy. First and 10, Winnipeg. They are at the 39 of the Eskimos. Hand off to Cannon, he cuts back and gets inside the 35 yard line with 6.37 remaining. Well, the rushing yards have been tough to come by today for the Bombers. Well, it's a little cool as that sun drops in behind the west side grandstand at Winnipeg Stadium. Still in the sunshine over in the east side is Joe Farragelli, the Edmonton coach. Pass complete to Terry Cochran. He's got a first down.
But that pairing where he looks inside and reads that linebacker. He, he has Jeff Smith coming to the inside. Cochran going to the outside. The linebacker didn't go with him. Throw to the back in the flat. Cochran makes the catch. Gets it turned up field. And Benjamin makes the tackle. But they get that first and ten. That's the big thing. The ball just outside the 25. First and ten Winnipeg. Initially signaled Edmonton ball, but then he was overruled by the referee. Oh, he was definitely had to be overruled. That everybody in the stands from this side of the field could see who knocked it out of bounds. Watch Junior Robinson just can't get balanced to catch the ball. Now watch number 10, Rod Hill, go get the football right there. No doubt who hit it. So Winnipeg takes over first and ten. The ball is at the 41 of Edmonton with 5:35 remaining. A handoff to Cannon. He bounces off a couple of tackles. Make that Cochran the ball carrier to the 35-yard line. Coaches refer that to a, a lead draw where one back leads the other one through the hole. Salisbury comes back, hands the ball to Cochran. Now he just starts running. You see the back come in to try to block the linebacker, but Cochran's running ability is what got him those six yards. Salisbury on second down for Randy Fabry for a first down. Nice catch by Fabry. Good coverage by Tony. Tony couldn't cover him any better. And the clock is running. Five minutes remaining in the game. You think there might be a little cheering going on in Regina if the Winnipeg Blue Bombers should manage to hang on here? I would think there might be. Intended for Fabi, incomplete. You look back in that sun into the shade, very hard to see the football. It was a little bit too far anyway, but it's very hard to see over there. Winnipeg, second and 10 from the 29 of the Edmonton Eskimos. See the shade? And when you're out here and you turn and look back, and the first thing you see is the sun, you won't even see the ball coming out of that shaded area. Salisbury throwing to Perry Tuttle. They rule that he didn't make the catch. Get a wolf to the oh, he'd have been five or six uh, yards short Donnie anyway. Out. Watch the fake. Watch the fake. Donnie. Oh, 
Farragalli concerned about a possible fake as Winnipeg sends out its field goal unit. I don't think Winnipeg would take any chances here and attempt to fake. I think Trevor Kennard will be attempting the field goal from 36 yards up. Well, I think the big thing, it'll give him a four-point lead and force Edmonton to score a touchdown. I think he'll kick it. It's blocked! And the Edmonton Eskimos are going to pick it up. Brett Williams, I believe, blocked it. Larry Ruck had the first shot at it, and Edmonton takes over at midfield. Well, we talked about how well Brett Williams was playing. He really came free up the middle in a hurry straight at the kicker. You know, if you get a rush from the outside, you could miss it, but it's hard for a guy to come that clean. Watch out clean, right up the middle, inside. There he goes. Boy, right inside number 66, Steve Rota Husker, and he really blocked it. That ball barely got up. And that's how Mike Riley reacts at the Winnipeg bench, and I'm sure the Winnipeg fans felt the same way. Damon Allen going to the sidelines. It was almost intercepted over on the far side by James Jefferson. You know when a quarterback throws a football low, he's a little disappointed. But he better be happy and that was low because Jefferson had it the other way. Too <laughs> much. Well, that's a great effort, Brad. I mean, he came through there clean. 3:33 is the time remaining. Winnipeg leading by a single point. Second and 10, Edmonton. They are at their own 54. Winnipeg showing blitz. Benny Thompson couldn't get through. The pass is incomplete. Over the middle, intended for Marco Sincar, the man Damon Allen seems to prefer to go to in those second down plays. Well, Sincar's made a lot of big catches for him today. And when a guy's catching the football, yeah, you'll go back to him. He got into the hole behind the linebackers, but he had to deliver it just a little bit too high. Well, these final 317 will be rather anxious for Winnipeg and head coach Mike Riley as Jerry Clark stands at his own 40 yard line for this third down kick. Jefferson takes it at the three yard line. Good run back up to the 20. Good job of returning that kick. Got about 15 yards for it. A 64-yard kick by Jerry Carrick. 254 remains in the game. Uh, Brooklyn 9, this is Gopher calling the Stork. What's your 20? Come on back, please. Uh, Stork, where are you? Buddy, you're new here at 0800. Anyone out there seen a Honda rig? How is Priority Post EMS Courier better connected? Through an experienced national network with reliable next business day delivery most everywhere in Canada and all the choice, convenience, and price features you'll ever need through better connections to the U.S. And through the EMS Courier Network, better connected to Europe and to over 60 countries right around the world. Priority Post EMS Courier, Canada's better business connection. Sega challenges you with Afterburner, a game so exciting you can imagine you're in for the fight of your life. Game and Master System sold separately. Afterburner gives you the real dogfight excitement of the arcade version. Yeah. Like barrel rolls, nose dives, supersonic speed, and radar lock-ons. Your turn up burn. Let's take it home. Afterburner, only on the Sega system. Sega, the challenge will always be there. Well, for one of these gentlemen, this will be a very pleasant Thanksgiving day. In two minutes and 50 seconds, we'll know which one will enjoy it the most. Pass intended for Terry Cochran, incomplete. It's a good job by the Eskimo defense. They try that same pattern where they move that inside receiver in and then hit the back in the flat. They jammed it. They didn't allow it to develop, and that forced Sal Salisbury to throw it away. The Blue Bombers leading by a single point have to try and take some of the time off that scoreboard clock or they'll be giving the ball to Edmonton in excellent field position. This is a big series for Winnipeg. Pass is complete and they've got a first down. Harry Tuttle making the catch 
just across the 30 yard line. Ball was delivered low and Tuttle went down and got it. That's a big play for Winnipeg. You say take time off the clock. They got to do that and move the football or they're in danger of losing. Watch it turns that side. Watch it down low. Tuttle just goes down. Catch it. That's good offense. First and 10 Winnipeg. The Bombers at their own 31. 227 is the time remaining. Offside will be the fall against Edmonton. Danny Bass, I think, the middle linebacker. Or perhaps it was the thought, safety, Don Wilson, who had moved up. Yeah, it looked like the safety was trying to time it. He missed it. Offside, Edmonton number 20. First down repeat. But he was trying to hit it on the run. They want to mess everything up on first down from the reverse angle. Here he comes. He got too far inside. Vernon Paul into the ball game now. Cannon is out of the game. A handoff to Terry Cochran. And Cochran got to the line of scrimmage. Not much more with 2.19 remaining. It will be second and about four. As soon as I saw send Vernon Paul in for Cannon on first down, he almost anticipated a draw. They tried to run him. Edmonton just stuffed it, so they gained nothing. Still second and five. Well, this is where the Eskimo defensive unit has to come up big. Pass complete to Perry Tuttle. He's going to be just a little short, I think, of a first down, depending upon where they spot it. Well, where they got it spotted, he's going to have it. But they got it just between that two lines. He made it. Yes, he did. He had turned back, but they ruled his forward progress had carried beyond the 41. Well, that's that pattern again where they bring the back out of the backfield. Tuttle just goes down and hooks right behind him. He made the catch, managed to get the first down. Well, this is where Winnipeg would love to have a solid ground game so that they could chew up the clock. Boy, that you're exactly right, Don. You're, this is where you start counting first and tens. You don't worry about the touchdowns. Be able to chew the clock up on the ground. Right now, they haven't been able to do that all day, though. Barry Tuttle is having his left ankle looked at. He has scored a touchdown and caught six passes for 130 yards. Came into the game with just 27 receptions, somewhat below the production the Bombers had hoped to get out of Tuttle in this 1988 season. I think we see what they're talking about. I think, I think the big thing is that what has happened is that the Bomber quarterback shuffled, you know, with the injuries and the on the bench, off the bench. They have been inconsistent here. I don't think it's their receivers. I think it's been their quarterbacks. That was a little different last year when Tom Clements was throwing strikes. Oh, yeah, he got rid of the ball so quick. The receivers don't even know who their quarterbacks are this year. Every week they have a new one. Ken Whiting into the ball game. Replacing Perry Tuttle. Terry Cochran struggles out to about the 44. Well, you said it right. He struggled because that Winnipeg defense, they know they're going to run the ball on first down and they're getting everybody up on the line of scrimmage. Well, Jerry Corrick was the hero in the dying seconds of last year's Grey Cup game. Will he get an opportunity to emerge as the hero in this Thanksgiving Day battle? A minute and 25 seconds remaining. Second down, Winnipeg. The handoff to Terry Cochran, and he won't get the first down. He is stopped at the 45-yard line by Stuart Hill. Well, I was just looking down there to where Bobby Cameron is going to be putting from, and I wouldn't be surprised that they would give Corrick a shot at a field goal from up to 60 yards. So they're going to have a shot to get it. I think because in the pregame, he was reaching it from 60. Winnipeg kicking into that win. Bob Cameron has a 41.3 yard average. And he's done a pretty good job in kicking into the win. Although he did hit one just 20 yards in this fourth quarter. I still think Don, if I had to go against the win, he's the guy I'd want kicking. You know, even at 27 yards, there was no return on it. He gets a good kick away into the win. Taken by Tom Richards at the 20-yard line. 
And Richards is stopped at the 29. A 45-yard kick and 11-yard return with 110 remaining. Well, I'll just look at that now. I would say they need around 30 yards to get a legitimate shot. Park to try a 60-yarder, and they got 110 to do it. It's been a very entertaining football game at Winnipeg Stadium. Damon Allen has the pass knocked down. I think it was Dan Wicklum who got his hands up in front of the throw. Play a little volleyball, batted it up in the air. Damon Allen had that crossing pattern on where Sinkar comes underneath Richards over the top. He stops. Here comes the underneath receiver at the top of your screen, and Wicklum, as you say, batted it. Now watch Damon Allen. He bats it with his right hand and bats it away. 103 is the time remaining, second and 10. Here comes the pressure. The ball is fumbled. Who's got it? Winnipeg. Just a little bit. He's been dancing all over the field. Well, Winnipeg was going after Damon Allen on second down. They knocked it away, and it was recovered by Willie Fears. And now Terry Cochran takes it down to the 20-yard line with 55 seconds remaining. Well, they had to hustle to get that playoff. They snapped the ball with three seconds left on that 20-second clock. Boy, good pressure from the Winnipeg defense all of a sudden. Here they come, the outside. James West knocks it loose, and Fears comes up with the football. The clock is running, with Winnipeg looking at second and about four. They won't get a first down. 35 seconds remaining. Well, now there's a decision right now. With 30, they're going to go for that field goal, or is Cameron going to punt it? No, a field goal with Kennedy. But the decision right now is maybe take 20 seconds off on third down and just kill it, give them eight or nine seconds. But right now, I'm not for sure Edmonton would call timeout right here. But they didn't do it. They're almost tempted to take a delay of the game. Kennedy with the kick. It's good. 13 seconds, the time remaining. So now the Edmonton Eskimos must put it in the end zone. That's right. That's what they tried to do a while ago when Brett Williams blocked that field goal. This time, Kendrick made no mistake, got good blocking up front. And they kicked it through, and they have that four-point lead. The Edmonton Eskimos scrimmaging from the 35-yard line, first and 10. The gizmo wide left, Sandusky comes out to the right. Damon Allen throwing deep down the sidelines. The ball hangs up there. It's knocked away by Winnipeg. James Jefferson and Benny Thompson were both over there defending. I think it was Jefferson who finally knocked it down. Well, the best thing he did is when that ball bounced off his chest, is he reached out with that left arm. Watch. It bounces up in the air, and you'll see a white jersey coming, and he just kind of left-hands it and bats it away from everybody. Five seconds remaining. This might very well be the final play of the ball game. Edmonton, second and ten from the 35. throw that hitch screen out there to Jim Sandusky and that's the ball game the Winnipeg Blue Bombers defeating the Edmonton Eskimos 21 17 
with a fourth quarter comeback that moves them into sole possession of second place in the East, four points behind the Toronto Argonauts, and leaves the Edmonton Eskimos tied for first place in the West with Saskatchewan. And a very happy Mike Riley on that Winnipeg bench celebrates his team's eighth win of the season. And well, he should. That was a hard five football game. Both ways, touchdowns were tough to come by today. Finally, Winnipeg got some offense going on those two big catches by Murphy. So the Winnipeg Blue Bombers win it behind Sean Salisbury, 21-17 over the Edmonton Eskimos. Benchley. Chief tells me you've come up with some boffo idea on how to boost sales. Mm-hmm. Team selling. Hmm. Meaning inside sales and outside sales work together? So you'd phone to set up contact. Long distance. And I'd go in, and you'd follow up by phone and maybe even close the sale. Why, that would mean extra time. For you to drum up some new business, too. That would be teamwork. Chief. Now that is a bright idea. Team selling from Bell. <laughs> Don't be late. There's a new day. A what? It's true. Canada Savings Bonds are early this year. Are they as flexible as ever? Oh, yes. Cashable any time and fully secure so they never fall in value. Just keep on growing. Buy yours by November 1st. Oh, what? Oh, you'll be late. Oh, dear. Too late? Oh, dear. For Canada Savings Bonds. On sale October 20th to November 1st. Maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe you'll just have to replace your connecting rods. But maybe you'll need new valves. Then your bearings and crankshaft could go. Maybe even your rings and pistons. But you can help prevent all this for just a few dollars with a Fram oil filter. So you can pay a few dollars now, or a lot later. of memories crystallized on CBC remember 1961 Maloney is the quarterback he's going to pass it's complete to back to the Still capturing the moments. The CFL on CBC. Our CBC MVP this afternoon, Winnipeg wide receiver James Murphy. Four catches for 97 yards, including a touchdown. Not so much for quantity, but for the quality of the receptions he made. He was chosen our MVP. And besides that, it's his birthday. He's standing by with Scott O. All right, Don, let's begin with the obvious, James Murphy. Happy birthday. Uh, thank you, Scott. 29 years ago a day. Uh, you know, a son was born to James Sarah Murphy. I'm just happy to be alive. <laughs> I thought you were going to give us your life history there. Hey, I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> a day like this, you know, I, I guess that helped. That gave me more determination to go out and play hard. And, uh, and you know, Edmonton is a tough football team. And I uh, just, we should be proud uh, to have this victory. James, some would suggest this has been an off year for the Winnipeg offense, but your stats, you're on the verge of going over 1,000 yards again, would suggest otherwise. Well, I can really care less about the stats, but whenever I play well, the team, uh, we do well offensively. Uh, first half, I thought uh, we had some mis miscues, and uh, I thought it should have been a wider margin than what it was. However, uh, you never look down your nose at a win, so I'm happy to, to have a win, Scott. Like every receiver, you dream of catching them in full flight uh, on the way to the end zone. Uh... Both catches on the touchdown drive or nothing like that, but you'll take them. Well, I had a, I had a, you know, week, week to work in this win all week long, and I had a, a advantage over those guys. So, uh, you know, I, like you said, I'd much rather have them uh, throwing to me hard. I thought Sean was going to be able to hit me on the post a few times, especially down uh, on the, going with the win, but uh, we weren't able to connect, so uh, got to take them uh, however I can. 
Three different quarterbacks have thrown the ball together this season. Sean Salisbury in this game. Uh, what do you think of him as a quarterback? I think Sean's come a long way in uh, the time period that he had to uh, develop. And I think he's just going to get better and better. I think if it wouldn't have been a windy day or if we was in a uh, dome facility, uh, it could have been a lot better uh, football offensively. Uh, however, I think Sean's going to be a, a star in this league. All right, James Murphy, congratulations on playing a prominent role in a come from behind win today. Thanks, Scott. Have a good afternoon. This is James Wild West. He of three quarterback sacks and nine initial tackles. James, for three quarters of this game, uh, you guys meandered in the wilderness. Do you feel lucky to get out with a victory? Yeah, thanks for God for the win, first of all. We were, we we're very delighted to have a win because we know Edmonton are defending great cup champs. We felt like if we played well against them, we, we know exactly where we're at. I think we're picking at the right time. That's a good sign. There's no question the Edmonton offense is highly rated. They've got an explosive combination in Damon Allen and Jim Sandusky and uh, other receivers. Did you feel as though you could shut them down coming into this game? Well, we try to control them. They're a real big play offense. What they try to do is get big plays. We felt like if we could minimize the big play. I think I thought we could shut them down pretty much as far as the offense is concerned, and I thought we did that real well. I know that uh, we shouldn't overlook the fact that even though you guys were in trouble for a lot of the game, you held them to 14 points for, for uh, the entire contest. Yeah, you got to also understand that, too, we had a lot of people missing game. We had uh, Paul Clanty playing in, and uh, we also had a new guy playing at nose guard in uh, Willie Fears. He took Sam Megawatt's place. We also had Tony Jones missing. All those guys, Jalen, did an excellent job for us today, and I think that's a good sign of a good ball club. Now, as we said, pressure on Damon Allen, the key for you guys in this game, certainly one of the keys. Let's have a look at one of your sacks. Well, uh, basically, what is this a sack here? This oh. is it. <laughs> I think I was just chasing somebody down on this play, Chris Skinner. Oh, I just, I think I just beat him to the corner. He wanted to turn up somewhere, and I just caught him and made a good play on that. And that's what it's all about from your position, isn't it? Oh, yes. We're just having a lot of fun right now, and that's good. Okay, James West, thanks very much for joining us. Congratulations Thank on the win. Thank you very much. Let's go upstairs to Don and Ron. Well, Scott, it certainly creates an interesting situation over the final month of the season. Winnipeg, four points behind Toronto. They have a home-and-home -home series coming up with the Argonauts, and in the West... Edmonton and Saskatchewan now deadlocked for first place. Oh, that's the way you like to see it. You know, you don't want anybody to run away and hide on you and make the final weeks. You got to make them exciting. And right now, you know, with Hamilton, Toronto, and Winnipeg, things are going to get interesting. And next week, we have the Bombers in Hamilton. Well, that'll be an interesting game. The Tiger Cats and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. At the moment, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, following their loss to the BC Lions on Friday night, trail Winnipeg by two. And Winnipeg, of course, four behind the Toronto Argonauts. And in two weeks' time, it's Winnipeg and Toronto in a home-and-home -home affair. The Ottawa Rough Riders, of course, out of it in the Eastern Division. But in the West, Edmonton and Saskatchewan, identical records. And the BC Lions are still there. They are at 7-7. Seven and seven, And they still have two games remaining with the Edmonton Eskimos. The Calgary Stampeders not out of it yet. They also have two games upcoming with the Edmonton Eskimos. Well, they're going to have to play a lot better football than we saw them play yesterday. But, uh, yeah, they're not out of it, but they've made too many changes. I don't think they're going to be a factor in the rest of the season. Well, statistically in this ball game, the Bombers came from behind in the fourth quarter, and they win it by a score of 21-17. to 17. But overall, the Edmonton Eskimos had the edge in first downs. Winnipeg with the advantage in the passing department, and much of that passing yardage was accrued in the second half. Sean Salisbury started the game, gave way to Roy DeWald in the second quarter, and then the confidence that Mike Riley displayed in his young quarterback evident when he came back to start the third quarter. We talked about that at halftime, Don. We said Sean Salisbury would come back, and, and Mike showed a lot of confidence in him, and, and I'm sure the way Salisbury played the second half, he gained a lot of confidence from that football game. You know, the one guy we can't overlook was the play of Perry Tuttle. He made some real big catches inside, but I tell you, I was glad to see Murphy win an MVP award on his birthday. It doesn't get to happen too often. Well, while Perry Tuttle and James Murphy were celebrating, a young receiver was lamenting Terry Cochran at two touchdowns called back. And in the first half, it looked as though that could be Winnipeg's undoing a couple of costly penalties when they were in scoring position. Well, you, well, you know, he had two touchdowns called back. Both times he went and got the football to keep, both times he slammed it back down to the ground. Just wasn't his day to score. His day will come. So the combination of Sean Salisbury and James Murphy results in the game-winning touchdown as Winnipeg defeats Edmonton 21-17. Scott? Don, we've come to expect hard-hitting games between the Bombers and Eskimos. This one was certainly in the fourth quarter. And on the strength of the fourth quarter, the Bombers emerge victorious. They're now in sole possession of second place in the Eastern Conference. And with uh, two of the remaining four games against the Argonauts, they are in a position to make a run at first place in the East. But a more immediate concern to the Bombers is, of course, holding on to second place. And that'll be their focus 
Next Sunday afternoon, when they're in Hamilton to face the Ticats, we'll have the telecast of that game for you beginning at 1 o'clock Eastern. Until then, goodbye from Winnipeg. The producer of the CFL on CBC is Doug Sellers. This game directed by Ron Harrison. Inside the CFL was produced by Steve Lansky. Our isolation director, Brent Haywood. And the names of the rest of our crew, production and technical, who bring you the CFL on CBC. We'll talk to you next Sunday from Hamilton. for their Ontario Junior Football Conference playoffs. AKO will meet Burlington in the first round this weekend. The Frat ended their regular season with a come-from-behind win over the London Beefeaters, and that gave them a record of seven wins against just one loss on the season. The University of Windsor Lancers took another shot on the chin on the weekend. The Lancers lost in OUAA football 28-13 to the Western Ontario Mustangs. Their season is all but over. Lancer football fans were looking for great things from the football team when John Musselman was signed as head coach just over a year ago. The Lancers did post their best football OUAA record in history when they won five games while losing just two last season. But this year, it's a different story. After the first five games, their record is one win against four losses. Coach Musselman feels last year threw everyone off, including the opposition. As realistically, the Lancers were a three and four team in their first year under him instead of the five and two that went into the books. Unfortunately, we created a lot of expectations last year that we're not quite, quite ready to live up to yet this year. And uh, we came in this year. Uh, the, the beauty of this year is the fact that we've been in every game we've played. We've played tough games against Guelph, Laurier, and Western. And we had a chance in every one of those games to win them. Last year, when we played Laurier and Western, we weren't in the game, not from the opening kickoff. So, We've improved drastically as a team, and we've come a long, long way, but unfortunately, from 5-2 and two last year to 1-4 and four so far this year, doesn't look like it. Uh, we know internally that we have, though, and we're, we're on track to where we want to be. And as I, I, I cautioned when I came, it was going to be a four-year process before we were putting a legitimate contender on the field. I haven't changed that, that view at all, and as far as I'm concerned, we're right on track. Uh, Next year, we're going to be even better, and the year after that, we're going to start to see some real fruits. Now that the season is down to just two final league games, there is still a chance the Lancers can make it to the playoffs. But it will take a combination of wins and losses for that to happen. An optimistic Musselman is convinced it will occur, and playoffs, here we come. We expect right now that we're going to end up in a three-way tie with McMaster and Toronto for fourth spot, and then it's going to come down to points for and against. We have to beat McMaster by 15 points, and then we have to beat Waterloo, and if we do those two things, I think we'll be in the playoffs. The only thing that can upset us there is if Toronto happens to win one of its last two games, which I don't expect they will, or if um, uh, McMaster would lose to York the last week, and I don't expect that to happen either. So I think our chances are very realistic, but so are Max, so we've got our work cut out for us. And the Lancers host the Waterloo Warriors in their homecoming game Saturday afternoon at the University State. And the Indianapolis Ice, to say it got out of hand would be something of an understatement. The officials completely lost control of the game. This brawl went on for about 15 minutes involving just about every player on both teams. There is no word what suspensions or fines might be handed out, but for any young hockey players watching, no, this is not the route to take to the National Hockey League. Un among the NFL games by a two to one margin. It appears that Canadian football is popular on the tube, but not as popular in the stadiums. The AKO Fratmen are getting set for the second season. The Frat go into playoff football this weekend with their main goal being the Canadian Junior Championship. Marvin Druzik was at the Frat's workout at AKO Park last night. 
and they're going to make sure they're ready. Nothing's going to stop these players from practicing, not rain or thunder, not even hail. Well, I would hope we'd be able to host the Canadian final here on November the 12th. That may be overlooking some pretty good teams. We never really want to look ahead, but um, we've beaten everybody in the league so far, so I'm fairly confident we're going to win the OFC Championship again this year. Then we would go to Montreal to play the Eastern Canadian Championship, and we know that game will be very tough, but uh, we sure do hope to host the Canadian final here. Last year, AKO made it to the Canadian finals, but were defeated. Coach Morenci says that's not going to happen this year. We've got one of the more prolific passers in the country in Walt Tasman. I think we have to establish our passing game. And uh, I know Regina and, and some of the teams we're going to face down the road are going to have some good passing games, too. We're facing a team this week in Burlington who has a, a real good running game, so we're going to have to shut that down if we're going to advance in the playoffs. Morency says his players are tougher than most because of the conditions they practice under. Because of the poor lighting at their park, it's not unusual for the Fratman to practice in almost total darkness. The lighting here is bad. You've been known to twist a few ankle in the dark. But that doesn't stop the frat. They're going into the Ontario Junior Football Championship playoffs this weekend with a record of seven wins against one loss in the season. And AKO hosts Burlington at Windsor Stadium Saturday night at 7 o'clock. Rule football, the Purple Raiders have moved up to the top. Assumption crushed previous number one Herman 54 to 8 last week. And Kennedy dumped Brennan 17 to 1 to move up into second place. Last week, Massey was sparked by a punt return touchdowns of 60 and 45 yards in a 25-17 romp over preseason number one St. Anne. The Rebels were not among the preseason top 10, but have since opened the eyes of many opposing teams. Riverside still undefeated, now number four. 54 to 8. That was the loss that Herman took at the hands of uh, the Assumption Purple Raiders for the last two weeks. Herman was number one. Things won't get much easier. And the Green Griffins play at St. Anne's Friday. They are now on number five. And checking the final. In sixth place, St. Anne. Forster in seventh. Sandwich eighth. And number nine is General Emerson. Essex has moved into the top ten for the first time this week. Hearst Generals beat the Sandwich Sabres 22 to 15. One of the highlights of the game was this play by Generals quarterback Paulo Amianchi, who throws a long pass to number 98, Kirk Carey, for a touchdown. The score, 15-14 for Amherst at halftime. The two schools have had a long-standing rivalry for over two decades. It dates back to the early 70s when they shared the same building. The rivalry began really after my time at Amherst. My time was really in the beginning of football in the county when... Uh, Mr. Wilson, Jack Wilson, was organizing the football teams and we became a very competitive force at Amherst way back then. But when they shared the building, the competition between the two began. It's just continued and I guess they're considered our rivals. <laughs> okay, so what happened once to go to the school in the morning and... Yes, they shared the same building and they shared all the facilities before this building was built. That final score once again, Amherst 22-15.